Jeff Todd here for MLB Trade Rumors. I'm back with MLBTR's owner and founder, Tim Durkis. We always get questions about how MLBTR even came about. It's a website. Now we're on YouTube. Uh, we have already put out some information on what MLBTR really is, but thought it'd be interesting to get the backstory. I don't know the whole backstory. I've been working for the site for a long time. Tim, how's it going? Pretty good, Jeff. How you doing? Yeah, today's the day. Today's the day. Let's do it. You know, Tim, I, I've you know I've actually read a few interviews you've done over the years, uh, and read the post you did on the tenth year anniversary of MLB trade rumors. But now we're coming up on fifteen, which is sort of scary, just because I remember the tenth, and I'm sure it's even more so for you. Uh, first of all, just. 15 years coming up on that date. I mean, how does that grab you just hearing that number? It's crazy. Um, 15 years is just a really long time, especially in internet years, which, you know, if you were around in 2005, you're ancient. Um, I think that's around the time Facebook began. And, you know, most of us can't remember a time where Facebook wasn't somehow, you know, a part of, of, uh, of life. So, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous to think about. And you mentioned that, that uh, 10 year anniversary post. And I feel like I wrote that about a year ago when in fact it was five. And so it is pretty strange. Yeah, exactly. I, I felt the same way when I went and looked at it. I couldn't believe it. Now in that post, and we'll link to that below so folks can read on it. We're not going to just rehash what was in there, but you talked about, you know, being, you know, right out of college, going to work and, and then a coworker encouraging you to take your passion and turn it into a blog but I'm curious, you know, how did your baseball passion evolve before that to the point where it was obvious to a coworker that you needed to be blogging about, you know, fantasy baseball and the hot stove signings and trades and all this stuff? How did you get to that point? Yeah, I think he must have said that based on uh, just regular, you know, uh, cubicle type of discussions that we were already having. And maybe the level at which I would discuss these things was a little different than the casual fan. So for me, when I think back to my interest in, in kind of the hot stove side of baseball or, or in the geekier side of baseball, um, it goes back generally to, I mean, of course I played it since I, since as far back as I can remember, but um, I was a huge Cubs fan, so we didn't have cable. So the Cubs being on WGN was a big factor in my life. And I'm sure, you know, it's the reason the Cubs still have fans across the country. Um, and so I was a Cubs fan, and the Cubs, of course, in the uh, 80s and 90s, did a ton of losing. Um, so there was always more hope in the off season, I think, than in the actual season. I remember the, the year that they started the season 0-14, and it was, it was a huge news story. If you look at that season, I think it might have been 1997 or so, um, the season was essentially over before it began. So, you know, when they go and kind of did some of these off-season signings, you know, many of which turned out to be fairly uh, ham-handed. Um, but, you know, I would get excited. I was 14, 15 years old. And, you know, I, I, one series of moves I remember that they did that actually worked out was when they signed uh, Jeff Blauser and Kevin Tappany and those guys. And that's when Kerry Wood was just coming on as a rookie. And I, they went to the playoffs in 1998, so it worked out. But I remember following that stuff very closely, and, and back at, at that time, you would uh, hear that news on the radio. Um, so that's how I caught that, and I would pick it up in the newspaper. We had the Chicago Tribune delivered. Um, I would flip to the transaction section and catch up that way. So I had a lot of interest um, in that way. And then in high school, I started playing fantasy baseball, kind of the... Uh, the pencil and paper style league um, with my friend and his dad and his dad's friends. So there was a level of competition there that, that and we still have that league now. So that definitely sparked kind of the uh, geekier side of my interest. Yeah, I remember some early Yahoo fantasy baseball, but I never, I was not as old school as you. The earliest I went with that sort of stuff was like the uh, NCAA brackets. That used to be crazy in elementary school. I'll always remember that. So obviously that sort of carried through because I know when you started MLB Trade Rumors, it was actually the second website. You started with Roto Authority, right? Yeah, yeah. And Roto Authority was, it's, it's really kind of a crucial part of the story for me. Um, it was my first website. I started it, I think, you know, four or five months before MLB Trade Rumors. And honestly, 
Um, when, when you're kind of messing around with, with, with a little bit of entrepreneurship in mind, you don't really know which horse is going to be the one to bet on. So when I started Roto Authority, I definitely had uh, the seed of the idea that maybe one day I could quit my job and do this, um, but that my job would involve fantasy baseball. I thought maybe somebody would hire me full time to write about fantasy baseball. Um, but I also uh, cooked up these uh, projection spreadsheets where I projected stats for um, all the players. Um, and, you know, it was not not nearly as, as sophisticated as what you'll see now, but it was decent at the time. And so I would sell those for 10 bucks a pop and actually had some modest success on there. And so for, for quite a while, for even past MLB Trade Rumors uh, beginning, I, I did think Roto Authority might be my path. Um, I remember putting decent effort into promoting it. I remember uh, being on campus uh, back at the University of Illinois post-graduation with my wife just for a visit. And uh, I remember chalking up the quad, writing rotoauthority.com all over the quad and probably got like two visitors off of that. And uh, my other big idea was to send packs of big league chew to prominent baseball writers to try to get their attention. Um, I remember that Rob Nyer, who worked at ESPN at the time, he emailed me three years later, uh, told me he found that letter with the gum on his desk and he chewed the gum immediately. So um, I, I, was, I was trying anything, but yeah, I thought it was going to be Roto Authority um, until MLB Trade Rumors kind of revealed itself as, as the one to bet on. So I think we can see why you didn't make it like just as like a, a crass promoter, right? I mean, your, <laughs> yeah. your ideas, uh, they didn't exactly take off. No offense, no offense. I, you know, I think that the site stood on its own merit, which is a much better way to build a business. But it's also like, I mean, you know, writing on the quad, that didn't work. Maybe you sent up the airplane on the beach with the big banner. That would have got a couple visitors. But how on earth did you manage to gain traction to go from, you know, getting a couple people in to, to read this website to something that not only began to grow, but grew enough that you felt comfortable quitting your job. So I think Roto Authority was kind of the spark that lit the flame. Um, at that point, I'd built that website up to maybe a thousand or fifteen hundred views a day, which at the time seemed incredible. Now on MLB Trade Rumors, a bad day might be four or five hundred thousand page views but back then the idea that a thousand different people might be reading what I'd written was pretty incredible this was 2005 so I wasn't starting from zero and I think that was a crucial difference because if you are reaching a thousand people um, things can go you know quote unquote viral a little a little more easily even though that's that's a pretty small reach and so that was that was definitely the seed is having an existing website that some people were already visiting. Um, but then I would I would just go around, I would go to forums. You know, this is essentially pre-social media. Twitter did not exist. Um, I imagine Facebook was probably just in its college phase. So we didn't really have that way of promoting yourself. So I would go on forums, I would answer uh, baseball questions and I would leave the link. So I'll just share the link to as many places as I could. And, and back then there was a little bit of a, a web 2.0 kind of um, blog cooperation thing going on. So um, there's a website, Baseball Musings, there was Mets Blog. And, you know, I would get to know these people and they might send a link and to the, their readers and kind of help you get going. So, um, but I do think the idea was just better. It was just a better idea than, you know, another fantasy site. Um, it was somewhat unique. And so it kind of did catch on on its own. It filled a niche that I don't know, that I didn't know needed filling. And so people did spread the link amongst themselves really without a ton of effort from me. And at the time, MLB Trade Rumors, like you said, before Twitter. So it wasn't like, you know, a fan could go on there and follow a bunch of different journalists or teams or bloggers and whatever and get all the information brought to them. And it was not also necessarily a world where there was uh, such a proliferation of, I guess, rampant speculation and concocted information that we have today. So, I mean, that that's a different world entirely, right? That was blogs all around the internet that needed to be pulled together in one place, but at the same time, 
you didn't have to sift through as much stuff. So how was it different in those days doing this work than it is today? Um, so that's, that's a really good point. Um, first of all, I don't think I, I want to take too much credit in the early days for my filtering abilities. I think, you know, I was probably throwing some things out there that, that weren't that great either. Um, it took me a couple of years to realize that credibility was, was very important and hopefully we could set ourselves apart on that. Um, but I think that, um, being pre Twitter probably helped us out in the early days. Um, just that you, you ha not that, not that you don't have to put in a lot of work now, you do the job every day, but all the news basically comes through Twitter. There's not a ton of other sources or, or methods that you might need to monitor. Whereas in 2005, I think you had to um, be a little bit more scrappy in trying to get the information in real time. Um, so that might mean going to ESPN and just hitting F5 over and over. Um, it would mean just refreshing all these different websites. It would mean cultivating relationships with uh, the journalists so that they might email you, me a draft of their story before it actually hits um, the web. Actually, I remember... Um, I remember Jerry Krasnick doing that at ESPN. I think he sent me his AJ Burnett scoop before ESPN published the story. And I couldn't go ahead and publish first, but I could go ahead and start writing our, our draft of that post. And as soon as ESPN uh, made that link available, then I would hit publish on my end. And so to our readers, it would seem like, you know, practically instantaneous. Um, and then of course, um, I don't remember how much of this you had to do, but RSS feeders were big, so we had a really nice Google Reader set up. You know, rest in peace, Google Reader. It was a really nice way to consume information um, kind of pre-Twitter. We had a couple hundred sources, and we would flip through that. We would just read, read, read. So um, the legwork to get the stories quickly um, was kind of uh, increased back then. Okay, so yeah, I, I remember the end of Google Reader and we used Feedly for a little while. That was sort of the transition point. But really, we don't even need that anymore. But by that point, that sort of media evolution had occurred. But going back to when you actually were digging up all these stories, bringing them together, I guess at some point it had to occur to you that you were kind of crafting and bringing under one roof an entire sort of hot stove signings and trades and rumors narrative and story and then at some point you had to decide whether you're going to own that and make it an entire business and quit your job i mean how how did that vision come together and then how did you actually make the leap like from a personal perspective to i'm going for it so the website kind of forced the issue um I'd been doing the website for two years, um, along with a full-time job, and my job was at a Chicago company called Performix um, in search engine marketing. And um, I, I wouldn't say that search engine marketing itself really fed uh, MLB trade rumors because I didn't really do paid advertising like that um, to help the website grow, but maybe being in that environment was helpful. And I had a, a very encouraging boss, you know, uh, his name was Doug, who, who knew about the business and he was a big White Sox fan. And we would talk baseball all the time. Um, so after a while, um, the demands of MLB trade rumors kind of started to be too much to do both things. So it was kind of like working two jobs and the ad revenue was good enough where I could safely uh, quit my job. Um, and then my wife worked as an accountant at the time uh, at a hospital, so she took care of our health insurance. And so I had this a bit of a safety net built up from her job. Um, I, I am not a huge risk taker. Uh, I, I love to watch Shark Tank, though. And, you know, one thing I'll always see on the show is kind of the entrepreneur with their uh, back up against the wall. And, and the sharks seem to love that, too where the person is operating out of total desperation and they took a second mortgage on their house. And if this doesn't work, everything's going to fall apart. That was not the case for me. I left my job on good terms. Um, I was fully planning on going back if, if this venture failed. And I remember, you know, certain coworkers telling me the statistics on small businesses and how many fail. Um, so not everybody thought that it would succeed, but I was already doing well enough after two years where I felt like, um, it, it was the correct move to make. And, you know, instead of having to take off 
my regular job to cover the winter meetings for MLB Trade Rumors, I could just do it every day, which of course seemed like a dream come true. So I did that uh, at the end of 2007, I quit that job. So a couple things to unpack there. I'll, I'll try to focus in on the first portion of it, and then I'll ask you about the second. The, it, you know, from a business perspective, my impression from having known you and worked for you for a long time now is that sort of not risk taking, but like building a steady small business, a good, well functioning business, not overextending, looking to grow, but kind of smart growth. That's been the way you've done it. But how has that evolved as you've actually gone and owned this thing? Because you started off as a baseball blogger and now you're really a small business owner. And that seems to be quite a different job, really, at the end of the day when you, you know, from a day to day basis and then, you know, sort of your perspective when you open the open the computer each day. Yeah, um, I've, I've definitely transitioned from somebody where I would say I was just a full time baseball writer. And um, I felt like at that time, 2008, 09, I felt like I knew all 30 teams inside and out and I could um, answer any question or kind of refer back to something that had happened a few years prior off the top of my head. Now you guys have that ability um, and I don't. Um, I still follow baseball very closely and I, I like writing for the website, but I'm more of a jack of all trades at this point, um, just having to uh, do anything that comes up from you know hiring to ads and, and things like that. So I would say kind of the tipping point for that um, was probably when my daughter was born in 2009. Um, uh, I, I felt like I wanted to take a, a little bit of a leave uh, a couple months. And so um, I brought Ben Nicholson Smith on for like kind of a three month, uh, you know, we called it an internship or something like that. And uh, Ben took the, you know, nine to five coverage of the website, did an amazing job. At the end of that period, um, it seemed pretty reasonable to hire him full time and for him and I to, to split the Monday through Friday hours. And so that's what we did. Um, and then eventually, you know, I, I hired you, I hired Steve and then you and Connor. And so the hiring as a, as it increased over the years, you know, my role as a writer has diminished and I've filled it with other things and I've got the other websites as well. Yeah. Writer emeritus now. Um, yeah. Uh, well, Ben hiring Ben, obviously that was a huge stepping stone, a huge, uh, point of departure to have an employee and operate the business a little differently. What other sort of major milestones, decisions, changes, anything have you seen over that past, you know, the past decade or so since the site has really become more of a full-fledged small business? Well, for us, um, I'd say in, in a sense, the meat and potatoes of what we do, um, it's evolved, but not really changed that much. So it's still, it's a website that's mostly text. Um, and we're still trying to, you know, be the one-stop shop for all the hot stove news. Um, but I, I would say kind of uh, the, we're a little more in depth, certainly than, than I was in the early days. You know, I would write some really kind of casual short posts. So you don't really see on MLB trade rumors now, you don't really see the off the cuff stuff. So I think the professionalism uh, has increased. Um, I think the original work is more comprehensive and better. I think we have some original stuff that we're known for, um, like the top 50 free agents and stuff like that. So I, I think that over the years, I try to make the website a little bit better each year. And I think we'd, we've been able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's been a nice steady growth. Obviously, we added uh, the other other major sports. The, the app has come along, different mobile developments. And now here we are on YouTube, which we had never done before, you know, the coronavirus situation is obviously throwing a massive bit of uncertainty for everybody in the entire world, no matter what they're doing. But, you know, whether or not in relation to that, do you have any sort of future vision, future ideas uh, for how the website, how the, its presence on YouTube might evolve and grow? Or do you see it mostly as like a continuation of that core premise that, that sort of started it all off? Well, you and I have talked about how you know the YouTube uh, channel can be a little bit different. I think we don't want to kind of just say the exact same stuff we're writing in posts, so we can be a little bit more opinionated. Um, we can sh we can show people uh, who we are and actually 
uh, get get our entire writing staff in front of the camera a little bit and give a little bit of that personality that maybe um, was lost along the way as we move toward the more professional website, which I don't regret, but I think the channel can give us that outlet. It's been, it's been very difficult with the coronavirus uh, for everybody. And, you know, what we hope to do at MLB Trade Rumors, we hope that we can provide a little bit of an escape. Um, even if baseball isn't back, uh, we're just going to do what we know. We talk about baseball. We, we write about the hot stove. We write about the rumors and what we think could happen and try to keep it fun and entertaining. So, uh, you know, like anybody, we're, we're sheltered at home. Um, we're just... We're doing our thing and, and, you know, eventually things will return to normal and we're looking forward to that day. Absolutely. And we appreciate everybody certainly for tuning into this channel. Hopefully that's what we're providing. If you have questions for Tim about his journey to get to this point uh, or why on earth he hired me, whatever you might be curious about, drop them in the comments. And please be sure to subscribe to this channel because as Tim said, we have a lot of great things planned for the future.